Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. My name is Steve Sesh. I'm the Executive Vice President. And we're very pleased to have assembled today uh, an exceptionally well-informed group of uh, experts and analysts to examine with us the deepening fissures within the GCC and given the involvement of Egypt in what is now often referred to as the three plus one, the Middle East more generally speaking. Uh, our particular focus today to a, a large extent will be what can and what should the U.S. be doing yeah. to help defuse this crisis? How can it protect its interests, our interests, uh, balance our equities in a region uh, <laughs> where there's a lot of competition now for attention and, and preference, if you will, and in a larger extent, what does this say about President Trump's recent visit to Riyadh and the outcomes that were uh, highly touted there, including this larger kind of sphere of cooperation on counterterrorism with our Arab Gulf neighbors and more generally, again, with Arab and Muslim countries around the world. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to my colleague Hussein Ibish, who's going to moderate our panel. He will do the particulars, introducing our participants for you all. We'll have a discussion and we'll open it up for questions and we encourage you all to participate uh, with questions to the extent you wish to do so. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, Hussein, over to you. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, my name is Hussein Ibish. I am a uh, senior resident scholar here at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. Thanks for coming. I'd like you to join me in turning your phones on off or vibrate or whatever else it is that won't make noise. Uh, and we'll all be very grateful for that. So thank you. I'm going to do it right now. There, I've done it. So <laughs> lead by example, I guess. Uh, we are uh, we're very, very pleased to be hosting this conversation. I mean, uh, the initial idea, uh, the genesis of, of this panel was to, to talk about um, the aftermath of President Trump's visit to the region and uh, so the state of US GCC relations, but it became clear very quickly. Uh, that we had to uh, narrow the aperture a little bit, at least at the outset, and focus on Washington's role and interests in the intra-GCC crisis, as Steve noted, it involving also now Egypt and others uh, in the region, perhaps the broader Middle East. But I, I think there's no doubt that it's fundamentally a fissure within the Gulf Cooperation Council. Um, so it, it's interesting to we sort of remind ourselves, because I think it's easy to forget, um, what a rapid succession uh, of events really took place, because President Trump uh, was in Saudi Arabia on the 19th, 20th, and 21st, right? And the, uh, the current imbroglio that has turned into a full-blown uh, crisis uh, began uh, brewing in public. I mean, it's been brewing in, in sort of private and, and semi-public and over the years for a long time. Uh, but the, uh, the public eruption began on the 23rd, which is only a couple of days later, when remarks attributed uh, to Sheikh Tamim, the emir of Qatar, uh, and then disavowed, uh, set off a firestorm of criticism and recrimination and counter-recrimination. Uh, and for a while, uh, it was uh, basically a, a rhetorical and a media dispute uh, with accusations and counter-accusations. And then you had uh, a series of um, events, including uh, some uh, diplomatic outreach that was uh, not well received by uh, the, the countries that are confronting Qatar, but even more importantly, uh, the release of hacked emails from the uh, UAE ambassador uh, here in Washington uh, and other irritants that led on the 5th of June to the uh, sundering of diplomatic relations and the crisis that we now have uh, full-blown, including uh, measures that are being uh, apparently reconsidered involving the disruption of um, all imports into uh, Qatar from the countries in question, including food and medicine, uh, measures that might impede family reunification, as well as the uh, illegalization, at least in theory, of uh, expressions of sympathy for Qatar in some of these countries. Um, so it gives you a sense of how thoroughgoing um, this has been, which is uh, really in contrast to the uh, 
earlier uh, break of diplomatic relations, which occurred in 2014 by many of the same countries, which was simply a, a diplomatic rupture. This has obviously gone um, beyond that. And the reason that I lay out the timeline and remind you of the timeline is to underscore how quickly and dramatically this developed and deteriorated you know, to the point that we have now got this uh, really unprecedented confrontation. And this raises very difficult issues for the United States. First of all, obviously, it puts a good deal of uh, President Trump's achievements uh, in the Gulf into question because uh, it was touted as all about unity and unity to confront terrorism and unity to confront Iran. Uh, and I think you can look at this um, imbroglio, this crisis, as representing a kind of contradiction between those two imperatives. On the one hand, you've got the Saudis, the Emiratis, and others saying that they're holding Kuwait accountable for uh, misdeeds or grievances precisely involving uh, terrorism. Yeah, excuse me, Qatar, thank you. Uh, uh, holding Qatar accountable precisely for misdeeds involving Iran and extremism. But at the same time, Clearly, uh, any sense of unity uh, in the Gulf among American allies is, is very greatly undermined. At the same time, uh, the countries confronting Qatar would say what they're looking for is unity worthy of the name. In other words, that the unity that uh, preceded this, and perhaps in a sense then the unity that was being celebrated uh, by President Trump and his administration in the immediate aftermath of his visit, was perhaps, uh, to, uh, if not illusory, uh, at least insufficient uh, for their liking. And I think you could argue both, I mean, insufficient for their liking, and now exposed as essentially uh, illusory, uh, precisely because of this rift. So the question then is, what's the American, what are the American interests here? Right? I've started to allude to a few of them, but I think our panelists can really help us um, uh, excavate some of those and, and, um, uh, and, and interrogate them with us. Uh, what's the best American approach to trying to secure those interests? Right? In other words, um, do we uh, adopt a position of neutrality? Well, we really haven't. Um, I think it's pretty clear that uh, for all of their tonal differences and the, the sort of manifest, the dif manifest difference in message and messaging, the policy that's being iterated uh, by uh, Secretary of State Tillerson and President Trump are functionally the same, which is everybody else has to go back to the status quo ante except Qatar, which has to change. I mean, they're, they're within that framework, there's lots of differences uh, in tone and nuance between Trump and Tillerson. But I think with, you know, what I've just laid out is a, is a, a very uh, important overarching uh, continuity. But will there be Incre as this drags out, will there be increasing pressure on the United States uh, to w move to resolve the issue quickly by, by adopting more of a, uh, a model of re returning everyone to the status quo ante? Uh, or will the United States continue to push for change? And how will it, how will it try to manage this dispute uh, among its allies? So joining us today uh, to tease all of this apart are, uh, and I'll begin with my immediate left and go down the line, uh, Ellen Leibson, who's Distinguished Fellow and President Emeritus, uh, Emeritus of the Stimson Center, and we're deeply honored to have you. Thank you so much uh, for being here. Uh, Hamad Tneyan, who's a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland College Part and a, a Kuwaiti expert. Kuwait, uh, as you may know, has had a, a very interesting mediating role um, historically in the GCC in 2014 and again now. Uh, during this moment, and uh, we'll talk, talk, talk to him about that and other things. Uh, Dave Duroche, who is a senior military fellow at the uh, Near East and South Asia Center for Security Studies at NDU, uh, down a couple miles uh, towards my house. And uh, uh, all the way at the end, uh, Ali Vaez, who is a senior Iran analyst at the International Crisis Group. So thank you all for coming. Uh, and I guess what I'd like to uh, do is get a sense from all of you very quickly. If you can give us a, a, a two-minute uh, overview, and then we'll get into the specifics of uh, basically what you think, if you could list, say, two or three core 
uh, American national interests here that override others and, and that are sort of, um, uh, that, that are maximal priorities that, that will guide policy. And uh, let's begin with you, uh, Dr. Lipson, please. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Hussein, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I think the United States does have a paramount interest in uh, enhancing, enabling the stability of the Gulf, and, uh, and bigger than just the a sum of the interests of the individual GCC countries. I think the United States has a sort of larger role to play uh, than that, and I think we're stumbling right now of trying to figure out how to, to move in that direction. You know, many people have said that we care less about energy than we used to because of our own uh, relative and absolute energy, the growing independence, uh, and I welcome what others think of this. I still think the United States has some residual leadership role to play mm -hmm. in uh, stabilizing the world's energy mm -hmm. market, of which the Gulf is not quite as important as it has been in, in the past, but I, I would s certainly put that on the list. Mm -hmm. Um, but um, if you'll let me, I, I just want to say yep. one more thing about, you know, that we started out, as you said, the discussion of evaluating the president's visit. And I do think it's important to a little bit just put in perspective that presidential visits are extremely important and they tend to be exaggerated and overanalyzed. Mm. Um, so I'm almost pleased that <laughs> events have taken us beyond the visit itself uh, because there are these underlying structural factors and these underlying uh, immutable realities of how the United States engages in the Gulf that in the end are more important than the visit itself. Yeah, uh, before, before I go on to the next verse, let me follow up with you on, on one quick thing. Um, it may be complex or not. I mean, uh, many people have suggested there that, that the, the visit and the uh, embrace of Saudi Arabia in particular was a proximate cause for um, the, uh, the, the, the actions towards Qatar. Others have suggested that no, it was brewing for a long time, and that whether the, uh, whether the comments attributed to Sheikh Tamim were accurate or not, apparently not, uh, it, that that was much more of a proximate cause. I mean, how, how do you see the relationship of, of the visit and the apparent policy swing towards Saudi Arabia and this, because he was very positive about Qatar as well, I mean, mm -hmm. you know, anyway. So I think even before uh, Trump was elected president, there was a, we were entering an era of much greater activism and risk taking mm -hmm. by uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates mm -hmm. in particular. But I think that Trump's persona, the way he connected in a, you know, whatever, some form of solidarity with the leaders was probably a contributing factor, but mm -hmm. not a determining factor, that I yeah. think he, probably um, gave them a little boost of confidence mm -hmm. that their pre-existing proclivities were going to be seen favorably in Washington, yep. that there would be less undertow, that mm, maybe that's not a wise strategy. So I think it was contributing but not determining factor. Excellent. I, I think that's exactly right. Let's let's uh, see what uh, Hamad has Thank you, has Hussain, and Thank uh, you. Uh, I'm happy to be here. So um, as, as, as Ellen said, so basically the GCC backbone is uh, for the Gulf security, that's mm -hmm. number one. Uh, and the US wants to make sure that there's a secure flow of energy coming mm -hmm. out of the Gulf. I think the president went to Riyadh with three main agendas. Number one is defeating ISIS and terrorism. The yeah. second one is countering Iran, destabilizing activities in the region. Mm -hmm. And the third is pushing the peace process forward. Right. Um, let's, let me just before indulging in the and uh, how the U.S. response was uh, to uh, to the crisis that happened, um, there is a lot of historical context to the dispute between uh, Saudi Arabia and UAE on one side and Qatar on the other mm. side. Um, there is uh, there is definitely they could possibly have legitimate uh, concerns relating to Qatari behavior, uh, that be that interference in their internal affairs to um, some policies that are colliding with their national security interests. Um, but until yesterday, there was no official list that was given to, to the U.S. or any other state mediating mm -hmm. the conflict. And what is more important is that the intensity of the diplomatic and economic measures that were taken against uh, Qatar were unprecedented and unwarranted. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been plus possibly channeled and sold uh, through these grievances through the GC, like it happened back in the 2014 <laughs> diplomatic crisis, or even privately through um, a Secretary Tillerson going to Doha or conveying these demands to, to, to Qatar. Um, unfortunately, we don't have a uh, time machine, so we can't go back in time. 
so what happened, the good news is that the crisis right now is stabilizing. The bad news, however, is that both sides perceived that the U.S. were on their side when this crisis erupted. And this sent mixed signals and confusion in the, hmm. in, in the region. Uh, I think moving forward, what the U.S. should be focusing on is that further de-escalation and uh, containment. I think the U.S. should stress that the hearts, minds, souls, and interests of the people of the region should not be impacted by this crisis. Uh, I think the U.S. should uh, push for a solution within the GCC, and Kuwait can play an effective mediator mm -hmm. role uh, yeah. in that aspect. Yeah, we'll, come, we'll come more to Kuwait's okay. role uh, a little bit later. Uh, let me follow up with you, though, again. I, I think I might end up doing this with everybody. Very quickly, sure. what makes you think that Qatar believed that the United States was on its side going into this? So basically, what makes me think is that uh, a lot of Qatari media, as well as some um, Qatari policymakers uh, that I, um, I mean, uh, media and uh, that I saw the statement online, mm -hmm. is that they said that um, a statement made by Secretary Tillerson mm. uh, sent a different message than oh, what the president said. After, after the event. Uh, yes, I, yes. I'm sorry, I thought you meant before the the crisis erupted on the 23rd of May. No, no, no. I said after. Oh, uh, right. I, after right. I see, I see yeah. what you're saying. So look to Tillerson and... And Trump's Trump. statement. Yep. President okay. Trump. Boy, they read a different statement yeah. than me, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so, all right. I, I understand now better. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, see what... Uh, Dave, can you uh, talk about the two or three crucial things the United States uh, would want to I'll, try to achieve here? I'll try to. I, I have to start off by saying my remarks do not reflect Department of Defense right. policy. Um, and I, I appear to be hallucinating mildly. I, I, I imagine huh. I'm in this alternative world where Phoebe Marr, Tom Lippin, and Susan Ziada are listening to me instead of the other way around. <laughs> but um, uh, the first one is the security infrastructure, the regional security infrastructure, and those are bases. Hmm. Um, if you want to see what the United States views as the perfect basing solution. I, I look at Britain at the heart of the Cold War, where you had specialized transport base, bomber base, uh, reconnaissance base, fighter base, uh, sea bases, uh, land um, depots. Uh, and that constellation has been built up very patiently, and it requires us to negotiate with multiple countries. We don't want anything that will do mm -hmm. that, because that's the only way we can project power into the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. This pivot is a mirage. The only thing we've done to implement the pivot... You mean, you mean the pivot to Asia? <laughs> the pivot to Asia, yeah. yeah. The only thing we have done to implement the pivot is uh, post, you know, is have 1,500 Marines playing volleyball yeah. in Darwin, Australia. Yeah. We haven't built a new base to do that. Right, exactly. So our power has to project from the Gulf. The second one is there are common, there are benefits to commonality in confronting our common enemies in the Middle East, particularly Iran. Mm -hmm. And the most obvious of these is missile defense. And the most effective missile defense from an engineering standpoint, not a political standpoint, would be a shared mm -hmm. network one that involves active cooperation, wired cooperation, in which electrons pass without people interjecting themselves mm. without any air between all the GCC members and the United States. Right now, what we have is a hub and spoke arrangement with the United States right. at the center and various GCC arrangements. That is dysfunctional from an engineering standpoint. Mm -hmm. And I am a West Pointer, and I got to tell you, it bugs me just <laughs> as a, you know, to, to see that dysfunction from an engineering standpoint irritates everybody. The third one is not an American uh, interest per se, but it is an overriding bureaucratic one, mm. and that is the need for stability and the avoidance of change. Mm -hmm. The chaos which we are seeing here is anathema to everybody in the bureaucracy, particularly at this point in time when the administration is so poorly manned. As of Friday, there will only be three officers working yeah. Gulf Affairs plus Yemen on the joint staff, only three. Um, uh, when it is so undermanned, the bureaucracy typically, even, even in times when the manning is fully manned, when it's fat, whenever they're confronted with something, they say, we need a point paper on X, they go to the old one and then hmm. say, what needs to be removed, what needs to be updated? Right. So right now, with the undermanning, the lack of political appointees in place, um, stability assumes a premium, which we haven't seen in my lifetime. And uh, the fact that you have this interrupting that stability or threatening to interrupt it, um, I think, is, is anathema. Hmm. And, and this desire, this bureaucratic for, this desire for stability, I think, helps explain what to many people is the most jarring aspect of this, which is the $12 billion F-15 sale announced a week yeah. after the president publicly says, Qatar 
needs to be put back in the yeah, box. Well, I'll certainly be raising that with you uh, a little later on. But again, I'm, I've got another f a quick follow-up, which is uh, the, the missile, I mean, I understand your frustration about missile defense, but there, it's not as if this um, kerfuffle, I think is the word you use, uh, yes, <laughs> in the Gulf has made that any more implausible than it already was, right? I mean, it, there wasn't any political move uh, to make that uh, practically uh, well, practicable. Um, am I wrong about that? You're, you're, you're not wrong, but, but you're not wholly right. Okay. Um, the, Good. The, the engineering is what drives progress on missile defense. Mm -hmm. the, the case for it is just unanswerable. Yeah. Um, if you're trying to defend the mom, uh, the best picture, the best cross section of a missile launched from Iran would be uh, not from Daman because then you only get the frontal. It would be from Qatar where mm -hmm. you can get a side angle, you get a broader radar cross section. And the engineering was, I believe, driving people towards that conclusion. Mm -hmm. The politics are interfering with the engineering. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, inevitably the engineering will win, yeah. but inevitably we're all dead. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, hopefully we'll be able to accomplish this before that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ali? Uh, Hussein, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to oh, be here. Thank you. Um, and since colleagues covered other aspects of U.S. policy, let me just focus on the containing uh, the Iran piece. Mm. Uh, Please. Which, um, which in itself is not a new policy. I mean, this is as old as the Islamic Republic almost. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. And I would argue it's a policy that uh, has not worked, because if it had worked, we would not have been worried about Iran's influence four decades after the revolution, uh, and has always resulted in unintended consequences. I mean, take uh, the war with Iraq, which was supposed to be supposed to nip the revolution in the bud, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, in fact, consolidated the revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would argue, uh, you know, you trace it all the way uh, to uh, the first Gulf War and then the second Gulf War and the invasion of Afghanistan, it has continuously uh, increased Iran's influence in its neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm afraid the trip has also uh, deepened Iran's concerns about a new push for uh, containing it, which has made Iran even more aggressive than it appeared or it really was in practice before. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is the first time Iran has used its missiles, not as a, as a test uh, after the Iran-Iraq war, but in operations. Mm -hmm. um, and what's not clear about uh, the Trump administration's policy of containing Iran mm. is the end objective. Contain Iran to what purpose? To totally eliminate it from the region? Well, that's fanciful and not possible, obviously. But, but what, what is the end objective? And I think the answer to that question is not clear. And this mm -hmm. is part of the reason uh, that uh, the policy is likely to count, be counterproductive. Hmm. Let me ask you this quickly. Uh, is, is Iran a net beneficiary, from your point of view, of what's been happening uh, in the past few weeks? Uh, I mean, the, 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 sort of, the instinctive answer is to say, for sure. How could they not be? Uh, but I th my, my guess is it's more complicated than that. But uh, can you talk about the, the impact of this on Iran's um, you know, immediate interests? Look, um, I think the Iranians have adopted a, uh, an active neutrality uh, posture mm -hmm. on this issue. Yeah. Because uh, first of all, I mean, divisions within the GCC are not new. Um, obviously, they would prefer a divided GCC rather than a united GCC. Uh, and, uh, you know, th I think they're following Napoleon's advice that mm. why, why interfere when your uh, enemy is making a mistake. Mm. Um, uh, uh, you know, and at the same time, I think they have no illusions about the fact that at the end of the day, Qatar is not going to, uh, you know, right. uh, leave the GCC orbit and join the Iranian alliance. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think they understand their interference is going to be counterproductive, mm. and uh, they've decided to stay this one out politically. Interestingly, they see an economic uh, interest benefit in it. Uh, I mean, already Qatar Airways had to reroute uh, all of its flights to mm -hmm. Iran. That has increased, uh, you know, flights over the Iranian airspace mm -hmm. by 25 percent, which is quite lucrative. 
Um, yeah. And at the same time, uh, you know, Iran has uh, started to increase its uh, lot in uh, uh, Qatar's uh, import of food, which is a three billion market uh, of which Iran's uh, 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 lot was previously just a hundred million. Okay, please. Yeah. So I just want, um, it is <coughs> supremely ironic, I think, that Iran's first use of uh, missiles against <laughs> in the Arab states <laughs> yes. uh, was to retaliate for an attack by the Islamic State, yeah. in theory, the same adversary that Trump's uh, effort to create a Sunni solid mm. alliance against. Yeah. So, I mean, we have this sort of peculiar situation. Mm where um, Iran's greater uh, aggressiveness of the past week is actually you know, against the same adversary mm. that the United States and the GCC countries share. Mm. Um, so, I, and yet, we've always, it's always eluded us how we could uh, bring Iran into the anti-ISIS uh, coalition. I, mean, yeah. I, so I, don't I, know saw, I saw a tweet to. that really captured this very well and that mm -hmm. said, while our allies are fighting each other, Iran is fighting our enemy ISIS. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, right. In the in the immediate sense, uh, that's definitely true. There's uh, an argument about the bigger picture uh, impact uh, of these dynamics and and its relationship to uh, a phenomenon like ISIS. But let's stay on the topic uh, of uh, of violent extremist organizations and terrorism financing. And I'd like to to ask you uh, if you can address the question of how since uh, it, it would appear that the first, well, one of the um, first action agenda uh, items uh, on, the, on the Trump priority list is, is terrorism financing. And so you put that front and center in Saudi Arabia and appears to be one of the earliest asks because you can track it and measure it and all that kind of thing uh, much more easily than uh, anything that's more, any kind of support that's more amorphous. Uh, what's the impact of all of this on uh, you know, American initiatives regarding uh, funding of terrorists and violent extremists? Okay. That's for you. Yes, please. Um, uh, absolutely. Well, I'm, I can't claim to be a great expert on this, but I do think that we had already developed quite robust uh, mechanisms. The Treasury Department mm. has been extremely active for many years now in and I think the banking sector, you know, the banking sector of this region, uh, since the 90s has been working with the United States very closely on uh, using every, you know, IT mechanism available to, to track finance, mm. et cetera. I thought it was a little bit of theater in the president's <laughs> trip. The, the globe thing was particularly <laughs> bizarre, but uh, maybe others know a little bit more about the background of that. But the notion, you know, it's really an incremental, perhaps an incremental change or uh, a, a, a theatrical gesture. Mm. Uh, it's not inventing from scratch a new form of cooperation that hasn't existed before. Right. I think it's uh, very much existed. Now, it may be also that the people who want to support um, various Islamist groups that some of whom use violence and also don't use violence, mm. you know, has become more sophisticated and harder to track. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, the bad guys also adapt to new technologies and uh, learn what the states are doing to monitor them and mm. figure out new ways to try to elude it. So I'm not suggesting that there's total satisfaction that what has been developed is sufficient. You have to keep, uh, you know, changing and evolving uh, these mechanisms. But um, I, I personally did not think that was something that was brand new. No. That has been a source of, uh, you know, literally back 20 years we've been working closely to the discomfort of some of the banking uh, leaders in the Gulf region. They've had to become more transparent than they wanted to be. They've had to share data that they didn't really want to share. Mm. They had to develop monitoring mechanisms of their own societies that I think in the past was something they would have liked to avoid. Mm. So I think uh, there has been gradual progress over many years in this arena, mm. um, and maybe it will produce new results. Um, I think the Kuwaitis are the ones who are now waiting to see whether yeah. there's more transparency on how bad are the deeds that Qatar is being alleged to have done, and you know, can some of those things be corrected or fixed? Would you like to address that? Yes. Uh, so, so I Great think point. 
I think all DC countries. Um, let me just. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. I think mm. all DC countries took concrete steps on on counter uh, countering terrorism finance. Mm. Um, and what's happening now? We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we need them to make sure uh, continuing compliance with the FATF rules, countering money laundering and, and terrorism. And even after the 2015 Camp David Accord, there was a working group that uh, came out of it, which is on countering terrorism finance. I think uh, it's very important, and uh, the current U.S. administration should be uh, forcing that. I think what's more important, when any state is accused uh, of uh, supporting terrorism, evidence, tangible mm -hmm. evidence, not just accusations, should be brought and should be handled through the appropriate methods. I think no matter uh, what is happening right now, uh, I think uh, in terms of certain political Islamic groups. I think working with the Treasury Department, who have vast mm -hmm. experience and, and they worked on this uh, previously, will be very helpful. Uh, what about the uh, Kuwaiti reaction to all of this, vis-a-vis, uh, -vis especially vis-a-vis -vis the charges against Kuwait, uh, against Qatar? Because you know, if you get into the weeds, often there's been an accusation that private funding, that, that two countries that haven't done enough to stop private funding, not uh, certainly not government funding, mm -hmm. but private funding of uh, violent extremists uh, have been Qatar and Kuwait. In other words, they get put in the same boat, probably very, you know, mm. probably unfairly, but you hear that coupling a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the question is, does this uh, make Kuwait nervous? Is it an opportunity for Kuwait to make some headway? I mean, what, what you know, how does this play out? All right. Well, well l I think let's look at facts. Yeah. So over the past year, Kuwait I mean, not not the not the truth or falsehood of the accusation. Yeah. Let's it's, not it's do not that. It's not about true or false, yeah. but okay. I think I think looking at facts is, is important in this case. So over well, the past year, Kuwait worked rapidly and swiftly with regional and international partners to overcome legislative gaps within uh, its laws. In 2013, mm -hmm. they ratified the 1999 International Treaty on Countering uh, Terrorism. And by 2015, the FATF affirmed mm -hmm. that Kuwait met all the requisites related to counterterrorism and money yeah. laundering. So they stepped up counterterrorism efforts uh, by increasing security measures towards suspects and sharing intel with sure. uh, with laundering. And um, and Kuwaiti courts actually dealt with several right. terrorism-related cases and finance or joining Al Qaeda or ISIS and found them guilty. Right. So Kuwait is also part of the global coalition. Uh, to combat ISIS, and they actually the, they are hosting the joint task force in, in Camp out of Jan in Kuwait. But so, uh, okay, that's all. That's good. Yeah. The question is, not what has Kuwait done until now. That's that's helpful to. I mean, sort of a lot of us knew that kind of stuff, and there's no doubt. And mm -hmm. you can go into much more details about what's been done. And I think I think both Kuwait and Qatar have a long list of real things that they can point to that they've done. The question is. Is this a, an op a ch more of a challenge than an opportunity, or is it a challenge to Kuwait? Is it an opportunity for Kuwait? Is it both? Uh, you know, just in terms of, of this longstanding uh, sort of um, diplomatic and uh, public relations problem mm -hmm. that Kuwait has had, uh, that has shared in a way with Qatar, you know, well, although the, the experiences are very, very different. Yes. Well, uh, well, well first, first of all, I think Kuwait has been working very uh, strongly with this, uh, with the U.S. and its mm -hmm. regional allies to to work on this, and Kuwait will always be sure. happy to to take further actions. There's no doubt. Uh, I think what's happening right now with Qatar it has less and less to do with terrorism. Mm -hmm. If you want me to be convinced that Qatar is a sponsor of terrorism, mm. first of all, you don't um, accuse it of terrorism at the highest level, then three days later sell them F-15s. Mm -hmm. I mean that's a joke. Mm -hmm. The second thing, you don't buy Qatari gas, then accuse them of terrorism. I mean that's another thing that should be concerned. Uh, so I think when it comes when it comes to Kuwait, uh, mm. they they took a lot of efforts and they will continue to take efforts, of course, and, and dealing with the uh, with the uh, with the U.S. on that front. But I think this this crisis, let's just put it in perspective, mm -hmm. it has less and less to do with terrorism, and more and more to do with internal disputes between Abu Dhabi, Riyadh, and Qatar. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be addressed in that matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, I, before we get off the issue of terrorism. Let me just throw one thing up to the whole group and see if anybody wants to address this. Because underneath this, the accusations of terrorism financing is a reality that there is no consistent definition, not only of what is terrorism, but who is a terrorist. Mm -hmm. And not just in terms of a, uh, you know, specifics that can be applied across the board, but even specific groups. Yeah, uh, just let me give examples just for a second. I mean, a big dispute about the Muslim Brotherhood. 
uh, as, a, as an umbrella organization. Uh, Hamas obviously uh, engages in violence, so it, c it can't be said it's a purely, you know, it's a renounced violence, as is often said. Yeah, on the other hand, it's a very complex reality. Hezbollah. Uh, are quite a few countries uh, that refuse to acknowledge it, Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, and many countries who it's at the top of the list. And finally, the PKK, which for the United States is a terrorist organization in Turkey, and not a terrorist organization, in fact, an ally in Syria, which is very remarkable. Uh, and the fiction that it's really very, very different in those two countries is not convincing. So uh, I don't know if anybody wants to um, pick up on that thread or just leave it as, as an observation. If not, I, I'll, I'll ask Dave to. to well, go just um, I'll, I'll pick up on it, but let me start yeah. by disputing your uh, timeline as to when the crisis started. Yeah. The crisis actually started with the uh, Qatar Muslim Brotherhood conference hosted by the Foundations for the Defense of Democracies. Uh, okay. And that was then the I day before. I the, can dispute that, but go ahead. I, well, I'll tell you why. I can take it back. Okay, further. okay. Well, that's, what, that's when the accusations were first put out there. Uh, no, you know what? They were even earlier because it oh, was yes, back yes, in yes, yes. January that JINSA started yes. the whole thing. So if you want to begin right. the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, the, the Chuck Wald article. Yes, in the, it, um, exactly. It began right. with JINSA yeah, in January. And, the, and there, was a, there was a John Hanna, but the the that, event, right? <laughs> yeah, the event um, was, a, was and a, and that clearly had to be dial. planned. You you can't just book the ballroom at the Fairmont overnight for mm -hmm. six hundred people. No, um, agreed. Yeah, uh, and that gets to your question, yeah, your, which was the whole the whole right. focus on that event. From my perspective, was Hamas. It was Hamas, Hamas, Hamas. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, sure. look. The United States doesn't have to, uh, you know, as a matter of policy, we don't have to, you know, make the academic argument, this is, this isn't. We just define certain groups within right. certain locations, and we recognize that the Brotherhood in Morocco is part of government, and in Jordan it's part of government, mm -hmm. and Sheikh Rashid in Tunisia is helpful, yeah. and uh, some people aren't. And then we set out the barriers there. And uh, 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 from strictly from a self-interested point of view, as a, as a somewhat chauvinistic American, mm. um, this is an opportunity for us because uh, our partners in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, have set out a standard. Yeah. And now we can hold everyone to that standard. Sure. And the standard isn't an academic one, it's a policy one that mm -hmm. we formulate. Mm -hmm. So so I, I think this is, a, this is an opportunity for us, and I think it's one that we should seize and uh, never never let people uh, forget this new right. standard. Grab this opportunity, that's a very good advice. Let me follow up with you then uh, on, a, a, on a different topic, because I think we've, we've done the terrorism part quite thoroughly. Um, let's look at, at arms sales, yeah. and, and perhaps basing as well with you, but uh, let's, let's, I mean, there, were, there are two angles to this. One is the package of arms sales that uh, Saudi Arabia and the United States reported, they were reported on differently by the White House and the Pentagon, right? I mean, different yes. numbers. And you wrote quite a, an outstanding analysis, early analysis. Others piled on with similar pieces that weren't as good later on. Uh, but I think you, you wrote a kind of definitive early um, balloon puncturing piece about it. Um, uh, and then there's the uh, F-15 uh, sales that went through, plus the uh, U.S. Qatar naval um, exercises that went ahead. So if you can uh, talk about the politics of arms sales for say, in both contexts, with, with right. the Saudis in Riyadh, uh, but some, of, uh, you know, big chunk of which are real, right? And um, with the Qataris in the middle of this imbroglio. Yeah. Um, and then we'll talk about basing after that. Thank you. Okay, so, so with arms sales, um, uh, let me, let me, the facts on the Trump arms sales, at the time that the package was announced as $350 million, yeah. uh, a billion dollars, $240 billion of that, I don't know what it is. I think it's, it, it is anticipated upgrades, mm -hmm. uh, things down the road. And that's not necessarily unreasonable, but it's nothing that can be documented in mm -hmm. any research that anybody's produced. Right. Um, 23 billion, roughly, uh, had already uh, been through the congressional notification process. Which under leaves Obama. You, yes, sir. Yeah. Well, no, no, there was, there was a half a billion dollar program that had been notified under Trump for tethered aerostats. Mm -hmm. So that leaves you uh, roughly 80 billion 
of weapons that the administration says we intend to work with Congress to get this for you. Mm -hmm. Much of this will be uncontroversial. Right. Um, so they've already notified about $3 billion, things like a blanket training case for the Saudi Air Force, mm -hmm. a blanket training case for the Saudi Navy. The one that I think might have congressional opposition is, is THAAD, the Theater High Altitude Air Defense System. Because of the Israelis? Because of the Israelis. Um, the THAAD radar, um, either if it's tethered to a THAAD unit with a software profile, it, it directs the intercepts. But if you put a different software profile yeah. in it, it can uh, cover from yeah. TAFE, it could cover all of Israel. This is the same issues the Chinese have with the THAAD deployment in South Korea. South Korea, right. Yeah. So um, uh, I don't know whether it will be uh, uh, genuine objections or just the normal kabuki dance where yeah. the Israelis get another six joint strike fighters in exchange for mm -hmm. dropping their opposition. Um, have they expressed opposition? I haven't heard. That. I haven't heard it. No, I, don't think I haven't heard it because the, the sale hasn't been hasn't gone forward. Right. Yet. Also, um, the relationship is a little different now. Yeah. I'm yes. not. I'm not sure the Israelis will be bothered by that. But uh, that's we'll right. See. But that's we'll see. Right. Maybe they'll take an opportunity. That's to get right. More, yeah. and, and and it's important to know this. Thad. This this is the same number that the U.S. Army has, and Thad mm -hmm. is not yet a mature system. So. Right. Saudi Arabia will be challenged to field this. You know, with yeah. with Bradley fighting vehicles, there's a generation of you know retired officers, non-commissioned officers who can work for the Vanell Corporation and do it. We don't have that with Thad. Mm -hmm. We don't have that many guys who have worked on Thad and then retired. Um, the Qatari sale was notified. The F-15 sale was notified in November, mm -hmm. and I'm sure the naval exercise was was planned in advance as well. Right. Um, what this shows to me, I think, is, is the fallacy, and, and people in Washington have been looking for a way to link weapon sales to policy goals. And what they want is mm -hmm. they want the web, the military to military relationship to be like a thermostat where you right. can send a message. You can change the temperature from 96 degrees to 95 degrees <laughs> by whole, you know finding one key exactly. thing, you know, spare parts for tow missiles, and then they'll get this. And the problem is, I'm convinced. Uh, after studying this, fighting over it at Brookings and all that, it's a binary relationship. It's mm -hmm. either good or it's yeah. bad. Right. And uh, I sure. challenge you, if any argument, any any article that about a country the United States has an issue with, look for the phrase, the military to military relationship yeah. is good. Yeah. And my contention is that if we have a military relationship, it's good. Yeah. It's either good or it doesn't exist. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and that's particularly true in, in the Gulf, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, though, so, uh, obviously that applies to the basing as well. There's been some talk, uh, including publicly, uh, from some officials of the UAE and others in the United States, about uh, potentially relocating. I mean, I think Robert Gates brought it up at that conference that you mentioned, yes. uh, the FDD Hudson conference. Uh, but in addition... Uh, others uh, have speculated about the potential for the United States to relocate CENTCOM and other assets from the, uh, the, the two important bases in Qatar, uh, or assets in Qatar, I should say. Um, you know, I mean, is this plausible at all? Is this, uh, I mean, how, how seriously should we take these ideas? Can I jump in? Well, yes, yeah. but yeah. I mean, I, I do want Dave to talk about it, but I'm sure, sure you can. No, please, no, no, please, after you. Please, I'm sick of hearing myself. Okay. Go no, go ahead, Hamid. Um, no, I well, think it's you good. Know, go yeah, ahead. I, th I think, yeah. Hussein, the, the, the thing about the base, mm -hmm. um, well, first of all, you can't just replace uh, a base within, you know, it would take at least, maybe David can jump in, but chip in, but I think it would uh, take at least three years. Yeah. I don't think that's the most important point. The most important point is mm -hmm. that after the Riyadh summit, you know, a historic Islamic Arab, uh, Arab uh, Islamic summit that all states agreed on concrete steps not only to defeat ISIS and terrorism, mm -hmm. but also created cooperation mechanisms on a whole broad, uh, broad uh, range of issues uh, facing the uh, challenges in the region. The president had a clear agenda countering ISIS, defeating ISIS, and um, Middle East process. Two weeks later, people of the region woke up uh, to see this crisis unfold, mm -hmm. and it's no brainer that everyone is 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 consu too consumed right now with the uh, whole problems that's going on in the Middle East, yeah. and they're not focusing, fully focused, to push forward these agenda, and that's the problem. And I think many U.S. allies in the region right now are waking up to, uh, and they are wondering where is the U.S. leadership today? It is mm -hmm. absent, and the only leader today, or he's taking a leadership role, is the French president, President Macron, who's urging regional stability as well as, um, you know, supporting counterterrorism efforts. So th does the U.S. want to see the, you know, Frenchies playing a bigger role in the region? It is, it is quite surprising. Mm. I think that's the most important thing that we should be discussing. Okay. Uh, Deb? 
you, you do know I have a French name, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, uh, well, 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 I, 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 well, we will come to that. When Secretary time. Gates threw that out there, I that was a four tooth suck in a very just. Yeah. And, and I tell you, Secretary of Defense Gates would not have made that statement. That was that was. Can you remind he me? He said he he just casually said, you know, we should consider moving the base out of oh. LED. Mm -hmm. um, Bases are both more and less than people commonly assume they are. People focus on the facilities and the infrastructure. But I, 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 I think the good framework for anal analyzing them is in three things. You can either attribute it to Philip Habib or Warren Zevon. Hmm. Lawyers, guns, and money. Yeah, both. Um, both, both great philosophers. <laughs> um, first off, lawyers. Shared the, authorship. The, the rights and permissions associated with the base in many ways are more important than any of the physical infrastructure. Recall during the 73 war, every country in Europe closed their bases to include Germany, to include Britain, yeah. to American flights um, resupplying Israel, except Portugal. Right. Uh, if you had done a survey of bases in Europe in 1972, Portugal would probably be among the least inconsequential. Hmm. So it is foolish to do this. Um, recall uh, for years, New Zealand, a country that we have probably more in common with than just about any others, no U.S. Navy ships were able to dock there mm. to make a port call because the Navy refuses to acknowledge if they have nuclear weapons. Uh, it is not inconceivable, you know, if you look at like the U-turn Germany did on nuclear power, if a Russian nuclear ship implodes, which is likely from an engineering standpoint, that the residents of Dubai say, huh, we won't allow a nuclear ship to dock at Jebel Ali, the U.S. Navy says, nah, I don't think so. We're not going to tell you what's nuclear or what's not. And then Jebel Ali becomes an off-limit ports, just as Christchurch did. So um, that is not inconceivable. And, you know, if changes of regime, the bottom line is we need to have a lot of facilities, and it's for legal reasons. And it's not just the permissions to do things. You know, will a country allow us to operate drone strikes from their bases? Mm. Will a country allow us to render prisoners to another facility now that Guantanamo is not going to close. Different countries have different reasons for doing this. Mm -hmm. We need to maintain a constellation of bases for that. Right. The second issue, of course, is privileges and immunities of our mm -hmm. service members and their family members. This is a tough issue in the Gulf because it sounds like the capitulations mm -hmm. under the Ottoman Empire. This is uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction. Extraterritorial yeah. jurisdiction, mm -hmm. exactly. Exactly. We, you know, Martha McSally is now a congresswoman from Tucson. Prior to 9-11, the big story in U.S.-Saudi relations, she was an Air Force pilot who was writing members of Congress saying, I'm flying missions over Iraq and then I'm not allowed to drive a car mm -hmm. when I get back to my base in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. That issue has not been resolved. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is guns, broad range of capabilities. Secretary Gates acknowledged LUD Air Base is the only air base that we can launch a B-52 from. Right. In the region. Two, two runways? Well, two runways, the length of the runways, and then also the arming facilities. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's there's the infrastructure there. Mm -hmm. uh, the government of Qatar has put $9 billion in an LUD air base. The last time I was at El Dafra Air Base in the UAE, yeah. American soldiers manning Patriots were living in tents. Yeah. So, you know, the infrastructure has to be there. And by the way, it is very, very, very hard to get the U.S. Congress mm -hmm. to agree to make a capital improvement on a base right. that the United States does not own yeah. and mm -hmm. could be kicked out from. So, you know, the infrastructure has to be there. And then the third one... What about one, the, uh, the uh, intel infrastructure? Well, the, you mean the command and control, like the headquarters? Well, that and other aspects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that is actually less important um, than you would think. Uh, people okay. focus on the command and control center. Mm -hmm. The buildings are nice. Nobody in the military wants to find the money to build a new facility. Mm -hmm. But the command and control facility could be switched off at one place in the Middle East and then switched on mm. at the same time in Charleston or mm. or Tampa. Okay, so you run it from anywhere. Yeah, okay. that's not really the issue. And then the third one is the rights of the host, uh, the rights of third country nationals. Yeah, this yeah. is why Bahrain is so important. Yeah. Not because of the naval facility, because they have a high school and an elementary mm. school. People are able to live there with their wives. We have more more Arabs have gone through the Bahrain high school than have been Fulbright scholars yeah. from the Gulf. Yeah. Um, and that's critical, and that's hard to do. So we shouldn't be cavalier about this. Okay. We, we should open new facilities, keep some of them on a hot basis, and every military headquarters should practice jumping for <laughs> a week every six months, you know, relocate the KOC to Prince Sultan Air Base in Saudi Arabia or something for a week, um, just as a matter of tactical expertise. But to casually say we should move this, move that, as if it's a, um, you know, changing a franchise from Burger King to McDonald's is, is 
does not serve American interests. Okay, I want to look at the at specific roles of, of different actors uh, for a second. Let's begin with Iran. Uh, and Ali, uh, can you talk about Iran's role in the region in, in two, uh, in terms of, well, three, three different um, potential variables. I'll leave it up to you, but there are three things I'll throw out there. One is the impact of the recent election. The second is uh, this, um, yeah, we'll go with Dave's word, kerfuffle, um, <laughs> uh, which, as you say, Iran is, is sort of hanging back, but still clearly influences its calculations. And the third is the, uh, the sort of um, uh, going forward of the JCPOA, the fact that it's, it's still viable and apparently will be for a while. Um, so I, where is Iran right now? Give us a, a quick overview with those three um, touchstones as potential um, guides for your remark. But you, know, you can say whatever you want, obviously. Sure. Um, look, I'll start with um, talking about the sources of Iranian conduct. I put it in the context of arms sales that we were just talking about, mm. uh, because I think it's important to understand how it would affect Iran's uh, behavior in the region. Um, you know, uh, the reactions from Iranian officials was, uh, uh, I would say, across the board. Uh, Rouhani uh, didn't take the arms sales to the Saudis very seriously. He said, you know, we are self-sufficient in our own homegrown industries, arm, arms industries, and Saudis have uh, purchased uh, massive amounts of arms in the past. Apparently, it has, has not uh, contributed to their uh, safety and security that much. Um, Ayatollah Khamenei was a bit uh, harsher mm. uh, and used that to drive home a point that he uh, often makes that uh, compromise sometimes is more costly uh, than uh, confrontation. Mm. Uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, <laughs> pushing back against Rouhani's uh, 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 narrative. Uh, and he said, look, the Saudis had to actually bribe the Americans by hundreds of billions of dollars in order to get their support. Um, but overall, if you put this in the larger picture, uh, one has to understand that if you're sitting in Tehran and you're in the shoes of, a, of an Iranian leader and you're looking around, obviously you feel that you're surrounded by US forces. Every day you look uh, south of your uh, shores and you see 40,000 uh, strong armada in the mm -hmm. Persian Gulf, right? Um, from a conventional military capability, uh, you're inferior to some of the much smaller countries in your neighborhood. I mean, compare UAE's Air Force to Iranian Air Force, which is a flying museum. Um, uh, you know, and you're not part of a security architecture the same way that Turkey is, for right. example, or uh, uh, that uh, the GCC countries are or have the support of a guarantor. Uh, so what the Iranians have produced in the past three decades is uh, an asymmetric means of defense. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, crown jewel of that in terms of conventional military capability, of course, is the ballistic missile program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second element is what they call a forward defense policy, mm -hmm. which is based on this idea of having partners and proxies exactly. closer to the borders. So of the non-state actors. Exactly. Yeah. So that you can deter them. Yeah. That's why the relationship with Hezbollah is so strategic and vital for mm -hmm. the Iranians. Yeah. Right? So yeah. if now, if you t look, take a look at that context and then put it in, uh, you know, add the element of uh, almost blindly supporting the Sa Saudi narrative uh, about Iran's regional role and you selling mean, them. You mean the Americans? Americans, oh, yeah. and then okay. uh, selling them hundreds of billions, uh, uh, billion dollars of arms. You realize that it will only push the Iranians to double down on the two right. elements of uh, their their um, defensive uh, okay. policy that I mentioned. Uh, which is bound to exacerbate tensions in the region. Mm -hmm. Look, in terms of the elections, uh, sometimes when you think about Iran, you have to have two contradictory ideas in mind at the same time. Mm -hmm. It has strengthened President Rouhani because he got a stronger mandate. He this time got 25, 24 million votes, a uh, much better margin of victory than uh, his, uh, uh, his allies uh, or himself expected. Um, but at the same time, the, the electoral campaign was so bitter. Mm -hmm. uh, and in it, he used such a rhetoric against the IRGC, for example, mm. that uh, there's a lot of bad blood there. And he has to tread carefully. And at the same time, the supreme leader, who is supposed to be above the fray, but mm. in practice, he has always been uh, the leader of the conservative faction, 
uh, and you know, take into account that the conservative faction has lost the past four elections in the past four years, this year's presidential election, uh, plus local council elections, last year's parliamentary election, and 2013's presidential election. The Supreme Leader feels that he needs to cut Rouhani down to size. Hmm. And he has started that. Yeah. Uh, I have rarely seen such a harsh rhetoric from a Supreme Leader about a president that I've heard yeah. from the Supreme Leader in the past few weeks, it's criticizing Rouhani on yeah. uh, cultural policies, economic policies, even reminding him of the fate of Iran's first president, uh, Bani Sadr, who was uh, uh, impeached and forced into exile. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, uh, you know, Rouhani is uh, in, a, in a difficult situation. Uh, we have to uh, uh, wait and see whether he can navigate these, these waters. You know, all Iranian presidents, as a rule of thumb, have been much weaker in their second term mm -hmm. because they collide mm -hmm. with, with the supreme leader. They don't have another election mm -hmm. to look forward to. But they to. always get a second term. Exactly. <laughs> Um, so um, guaranteed lame duck. Yeah. Exactly. But the difference here with Rouhani is, you know, he's the ultimate Ayatollah Machiavelli of the system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if he has so much experience working with this supreme leader, and mm. obviously he has witnessed the fate of his predecessor, mm -hmm. so he might be able to better manage this. Mm. But there's obviously no guarantee. Uh, now, in terms of well, impact on foreign policy, last thing I say, yeah. uh, maybe no, also no. a quick note on JCPOA. Well, you uh, um, we can leave the JCPOA, but but um, do finish the thought on on, on foreign policy. Yeah. You know, one has to realize that uh, decisions in Iran are, are are made by consensus mm -hmm. and by a small group of people who are relatively insulated, mm -hmm. yet reflect changes uh, that come through elections and mm -hmm. personal changes, uh, and. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and obviously the supreme leader is the one who determines the strategy, but the presidents play an important role in tactics, mm. and especially in creating the consensus within the decision-making apparatus, which is the Supreme National Security Council that right. brings together all the key decision-makers, plus the military, so mm -hmm. the army and the IRGC. Um, and that's where Rouhani can have a lot of influence because Guess what? At this stage, a lot of, I mean, each side in the zero sum conflicts of the region believes that the other side has a grand strategy, whereas mostly people are engaged in tactics. Yeah. Uh, and so tactics will play a very important role. Uh, and I think Rouhani will, will have an influence. Um, but again, it's too soon to judge. No, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, let me ask uh, Ellen, if I might, to uh, give us an overview, because we talked about American interests. Uh, how do you see the American role? in this, come back to, to the, uh, the GCC crisis and as a, as a kind of um, entree into the broader uh, American role uh, in the Gulf and between the GCC countries, um, you know, in the, coming, in, just in, in the coming months, but even in the next couple of years during the, as the Trump administration develops. Uh, give us a sense of what you think that looks like. Well, Ideally. just for the logic flow, why don't I start with Iran? So yeah, I, I do, do think the administration has every intention of, you know, continuing to demonstrate that its Iran policy is tougher than that of its predecessor, that it is more skeptical about any prospects for an improved relationship. It's skeptical about the virtues of the Jikpoa. But, but for now, we're in kind of a state of suspended animation, that really nothing big has changed other than uh, some of the language. And I think the administration, um, you know, some people have said the policy review will be done at the end of the summer. Maybe it'll take longer than that. There's obviously this problem with White House staffing and other crises to attend to. So in a funny way, Iran is not as front burner as we might have expected it to be in the first six months of the administration. But I thought that Tillerson's testimony mm. last week uh, threw out an in, uh, intriguing little hint mm -hmm. of maybe that I believe there is a debate about whether to be explicit about regime change and that we can only be friendly with Iran if it doesn't have this clerical system. Um, so I, I think there's a debate inside of people that genuinely believe there's no prospect for um, normalcy with Iran until there's uh, some kind of change. And Tillerson's remarks were a little bit guarded. It was, we want to support the people who are uh, working to change the government or something like that. Mm -hmm. You could argue that that's not that different than when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. We wanted to help would-be Democrats and we wanted to, you know, invest in civil society in Iran. But it sounded a little more ominous to me than that. It sounded like 
you know, maybe over time and at the end of the policy review, we're going to have a more stark uh, set of principles that would uh, guide our Iran policy. So, um, uh, you know, I think for the short to medium term, the I administration is now preoccupied with whether it can get the, the Sunni Arab side back in some kind <laughs> of a, a more coherent, um, unified position. And I think that my understanding is that Tillerson and even the president himself have intervened to try to prevent the Saudis from taking even more uh, assertive action against Qatar, that maybe there was an intervention, maybe others would know better than I, uh, to prevent actual military force. Remember when the Saudis did that towards Bahrain, and you know that at any moment the Saudis, I think, feel they could scoop up these little states that, in theory, could be part of the Saudi Kingdom. Um, you know, historically uh, and in even today. Mm. So, um, so I think that the preoccupation now is getting the GCC piece back together. Eventually, this Iran piece will will fit into some uh, bigger strategy. I personally think it's regrettable that the U.S. doesn't see part of its role as, um, you know, not just uh, toning down the, the tensions on the GCC side of the Gulf, but also trying to promote some de-escalation of tension between uh, the Gulf Arabs and Iran. I, mm. I do think that is a, a more transcendent mm -hmm. uh, responsibility of a great power. And um, I still believe that the region, even while we watch American power waning in many parts of the world, I think it's um, certainly the president's visit suggested that there's still a great demand or desire to see a strong American leadership. So I, you know, I would prefer that our message was a little more ambitious about mm -hmm. how we want to work with the countries of the region. Um, we don't expect them to the Arab side to ever trust Iran or to ever like Iran, but uh, something beyond uh, this this dangerous kind of stalemate. Um, I think would be an appropriate uh, thing for the United States to take on. We could be helpful in setting red lines for Iranian behavior, signaling to Iran, you know, what is um, uh, going to provoke a stronger reaction. So I think we have, you know, a lot of work to do, but I don't think the administration has quite figured out all the pieces of the package yet. Mm -hmm. So we're okay. not there yet. Great, thanks. So I'm, I'm going to do one last question before I throw uh, the conversation open to the audience. I'm, I want to ask. Uh, Hamad, uh, briefly, uh, give us a sense of uh, Kuwait's potential role in, in this specific crisis as a mediator. And there, there really are two countries that are looked to as potential uh, mediators. One is uh, Kuwait because of its uh, traditional role of doing that within the, the GCC and its, its relationship with the parties, et cetera. And the other is the United States. And so there have been many people talking about whether they would do uh, whether one or the other is more appropriate or whether you can have them work together or in parallel. Yeah. Uh, and so if you can briefly uh, touch on that stuff and then we'll, we'll sure, throw it but, open to but the as, um, uh, let, let me just come up with the Iran Please, go right ahead. You know, I think the GCC crisis, I think the GCC crisis yeah. definitely benefits uh, Iran. This is the best thing they could have ever wished for. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I think when it comes to the Kuwaiti mediation efforts, Kuwait's Mediation, GCC to Kuwait is not just an euphoric symbolic thing that unites the, the Gulf countries. It's the backbone of the Gulf security. Mm. And they learned this lesson back in 1990. And they will exhaust all efforts to end this crisis. And I think the U.S., like uh, the European Union, should continue to support these Kuwaiti efforts and hope uh, to uh, resolve this issue as soon as possible. I think, however, first and foremost, the U.S. should project leadership. Mm. So far, it did not. When this crisis erupted, um, the U.S. privately asked all parties involved to end this crisis within 48 hours. Mm. Nothing significant happened, and it reflects poor U.S. leadership. Mm. I think what happened over the past couple of weeks is a case study by itself where mm. the Trump administration should make sure that they do not replicate and, and resolve as soon as possible. I think the U.S. should not take sides uh -huh. and encourage dialogue between, between parties. And uh, let me just finish this, because yeah, this sure. is really, really important. I have a follow-up for you. Um, and to solve this issue, yes, Kuwait can play an effective mediator role. I think, let me be clear, I think Qatar's, uh, Qat uh, the Qataris should be responsive to their neighbors. Uh, the measures that were taken were, were unnecessary and unwarranted, but at the same time, 
the Saudi Emirati camp should be flexible in terms of their demands. I think, uh, I mean, Qatar no. is in a situation right now where it faces tough choices. Mm. So if they do not concede, uh, if, or if they concede to all the demand at once, it will generate a humiliation that the Qatari government and the Qatari leadership might not be able to survive. Mm. Now, if they do not address the uh, the concerns of their neighbors, I think it will also have repercussion. It will isolate uh, Qatar geographically. And over time, it might put tremendous geopolitical pressure on, uh, on the Qatari leadership. Mm -hmm. So I think it is very possible and it's achievable to for both sides to reach uh, can and should reach a compromise in the middle. Mm -hmm. And it can be implemented over a period of 12 months to save face on both sides. And later on, a GC ally or more can guarantee the implementation process by forming what could possibly be GC plus one, two, or even three. It could be the US, England, or France, or one or two of uh, these countries. An interesting vision for sure. The question, the quick follow up, and this you know, you know, just one or two sentences, does Kuwait, if, does Kuwait need that Amer missing American leadership you referred to mm -hmm. in order to be an effective mediator? Well, I think, as I said earlier, uh, Hussein, the problem when both sides perceive the U.S. to be on their sides, we need that U.S. leadership in order to present to both sides that we're not taking sides and we encourage dialogue. So I'll, I'll take that as a yes. yes. Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Uh, we'll uh, uh, solicit questions from the audience. Uh, we'll begin with the gentleman back there and then another gentleman back here. David, uh, we'll begin with, with you, sir. Yeah. Uh, can you, uh, there's a microphone, sorry. Uh, Good afternoon, Tom Lipton, Middle East. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I want to warn you, I've already asked this question to people tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> uh, I read a brief news item over the weekend <clears throat> saying that Prime Minister Abadi of Iraq mm -hmm. is about to go to Tehran and Riyadh. Yeah. And I didn't read any more about it. If that's true, how should we think of that in this context? Good question. Uh, I've heard the same thing. Uh, I, I, I gather it is true. I'm, I, I don't know, but I gather it is. Please. Uh, I think it's good news. Um, I think that we had already been able to nudge a slight improvement in Saudi-Iraqi relations. So the Iraqis have, you know, finally, and it's taken, in my view, way too long, been a little bit accepted back into uh, Arab leadership circles. Um, you know, they've never been in the GCC, so it's always mm -hmm. been a little bit as a standalone. But I think Abadi himself uh, sees a role for, for him to play as, a me as a, a, another mediator. So I believe he's, I, I think the Kuwaitis and Iraqis yeah. are probably familiar with each other's yeah. The problem efforts. is he's not trusted by, right. uh, the Kuwait is trusted by all parties, and my, that might be the actual X right. factor. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the only thing I would add to that is that uh, it, it um, plays nicely into, his, into the politics, that he's trying to create a, uh, a, pers a, a Rich, political yeah. persona of, of equidistance, yeah. relative equidistance, yeah. between uh, his version of Iraq, of Baghdad, and uh, on the one hand, Riyadh and Tehran on the other hand, so that he's not perceived as siding with, or, or perceived as being more balanced. That's his competitive advantage in Iraqi politics against uh, rivals like al-Maliki and even Muqtada, who, you know, are, are to his left and right on this issue. Uh, so I would say maybe it's as much domestic politics looking at the next year's election or anything else. Uh, we've got Dave over here. Can, when, yeah. we, when we come to you, uh, can you identify yourselves? Yeah. And thank, uh, you. Uh, thank you, and then ask you for uh, I'm Dave Pollack from the Washington Thanks Institute. for coming, Dave. Thank you. Uh, very interesting discussion. I want to ask specifically about Al Jazeera as mm -hmm. a factor in this dispute. Uh, how important is it? Mm -hmm. What kind of um, solution or compromise or outcome can you imagine on this issue? Uh, Sheikh Haradawi mm -hmm. uh, has been labeled a terrorist yep. by on the list. Uh, some of the, by the UAE and Saudi Arabia. He's mm -hmm. uh, one of the stars of Al Jazeera Broadcasting. Uh, in general, this has been a major irritant. At times, yep. Qatar has seemed to tone down the broadcast. Is anybody paying attention right now to yeah. see what the tone of Al Jazeera <laughs> Not is? Not toned down. These days? <laughs> Thank no. you. Uh, just let me just uh, broaden it a little bit. It's a great question, but let's not restrict it in exclusively to Al Jazeera. Exactly. Let's the, the entire uh, sort of uh, uh, media arsenal, which includes Al Jazeera and Al Arab Al Jadid and all kinds of things with different orientations that Qatar uh, uses to project its influence. So, yeah. 
Anybody want to? Yeah. Yes, I, I please. Would, I would jump on this. Uh, by all means. Um, so I, I think I think the issue is uh, it's, it's not just about Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. I think this this dispute between Saudi Arabia, Abu Dhabi, and Riyadh goes back to 2014. Mm -hmm. What happened in 2014 is that uh, they withdrew their ambassadors from uh, from uh, from Doha, and then Kuwait mediated in, in 2014 between all parties to to reach a compromise. Um, I think back then the main issue is that the uh, the, uh, the Qataris wouldn't support uh, the uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. uh, so ejecting Muslim Brotherhood as well as other prominent figures. The second one, I think, neutralizing what they perceive to be uh, a state-led uh, media attack by Qatar in, the, in, in terms of interference in their uh, internal affairs. And I think the third one uh, is that um, they might want to mold some of uh, Doha's regional policies that are not um, in line or on a collision course uh, with their uh, with their own national interests or policies. So I think they they do have some legitimate concerns. And when it happened in 2014, um, they agreed on the on many of these issues, and uh, they met uh, around weekly uh, in, Ria, in in Saudi Arabia. And until mid 2015. Uh, everything was going smoothly and according to plan. Hmm. So I think right now, uh, you know, as right now, things need to be clarified on what is triggering this new crisis. And so far, there is no evidence they can point to uh, in terms. I'm sure there are legitimate concerns and things can be discussed in private channels and diplomatic channels. But hmm. right now, we're not sure because Al Jazeera, even in terms of you know dealing with Saudi Arabia, uh, it, it lowered its tone way after the uh, the yeah. agreement. So I'm in, not sure what's going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, no, it's true, but I, I do think people can underestimate the ideational element to this um, uh, conflict, and it's often I don't think it's properly understood here. It, it either gets framed as you know openness versus closeness, or revolutionary versus counter-revolutionary, or I, I don't know democratic versus authoritarian. It's just something. None of it is anything I recognize, uh, but there is a profound ideational dispute between the parties, and it's complex. Uh, so, we had you, sir. Yeah, I'm Patrick Theros. I used to be the American ambassador in Qatar, 95 Indeed. to 98, and I'd like to take this dispute back to my time there. Mm -hmm. February 6, 1996, I was awoken at 4 o'clock in the morning to be informed that a coup had just been averted. Right. 600 mm -hmm. muddy tribesmen who had been infiltrated and armed by Saudi Arabia and the Emirates have been brought into Qatar with the express purpose of killing the Emir and all his brothers and restoring Sheikh Khalifa to power. The intent there then was regime change. I still believe that there are, as uh, Mr. Thunayan has said, very old dynastic differences between the Al Nahayan, between the Al Saud, the Al Khalifa, and the Al Thanis. Uh, and I believe today very fervently that the only intent of this is regime change, putting a pliant El Thani in charge, and bringing Qatar basically under hegemonic uh, control of Saudi Arabia in the same way as Bahrain is. And the other, in the other stuff, is there, a, is there probably financial support uh, for the wrong people coming out of Qatar? Yes. Is it? less than what is coming out of the Emirates in Saudi Arabia. No one could seriously argue that it's, uh, that those countries are any better off than Qatar. There is a difference on the attitude towards the Muslim Brotherhood. Sure. So my, uh, and I'm a little bit surprised from time to time that we gleefully decide that Arab states can't have a free press. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I, I'll take that as a comment. That's a comment. We, okay, okay, mm -hmm. fine. The comments are welcome. Uh, the gentleman here and uh, who's next? Uh, how about, uh, let's see, uh, uh, I've got you all, uh, the gentleman over here we're going to begin with, and uh, you first, and then we'll go to you. And I'd love to have some comments or questions from some women also, so, but <laughs> go ahead. Uh, this is not a, a men's club. Okay, so right after the embargo, the official statement by Qatar mm -hmm. didn't include Egypt yeah. as the, one of the countries that mm -hmm. uh, Embargoed Qatar, then followed by Jordan, which mm -hmm. had a partial embargo. Mm. So, uh, how do you see the significance of the Jordanian and the Egyptian embargoes in uh, in this situation? Very since interesting. It didn't 
you didn't mention that in the mm. in the discussion and Qatar itself didn't like Qatar, ch- ch- give it any attention. Like, uh, this is very interesting. Yeah, what about what about the regional yeah, countries? Role? I have I have some thoughts about Jordan uh, and but who would like to? If like anybody, to yeah, yeah, about please Egypt. do. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I um. Uh, uh, not not particularly germane to this discussion, but a lot of my Egyptian friends um, uh, are, are starting to reject this idea. There's, there's this narrative that's starting to take shape that Egypt is servile to Saudi yeah. Arabia. Yeah. And they point to this, and more to the point, uh, Tehran and Sanafir Islands, yeah. which I'm proud to say I was once the commander of. Yeah. Um, with those, um, in my view, is those islands have always been Saudi, but yeah. uh, people with whom I've had friendships for 20 years have gotten really angry over that assertion. So, so um, uh, I, I, I can't speak to the internal politics of Egypt, but, but I think that there is a narrative among certain Egyptians that uh, both the embargo and the transfer of the islands are signs that Egypt is for sale and that a proud nation such as Egypt should be above these sorts of things. Mm-hmm. I don't think it has anything to do with the merits of the actual case. Of course, the support for the Muslim Brotherhood uh, hangs on there, but but yeah. it's, it's just an un, it's a disturbing development. Well, ideologically, it, it, it certainly makes sense for the current Egyptian government to be part of this. I mean, it's, it dovetails with their yeah. rhetoric. The, the more interesting case is Jordan, right? Jordan? I would say that the keys, all the attention um, on the uh, question of um, how Qatar survives and, and continues to function has, has focused on uh, Turkey's overt support and perhaps some, some cooperation and offers of help re- and real support and not real support from Iran uh, and the airspace and stuff like that. So it's all been about Turkey and Iran, Turkey and Iran. And for me, I think if you look carefully, say that... Uh, Qatar's real ability to function in this process comes from continued openness, uh, especially from Kuwait, but also from Jordan. And that as long as Jordan and Kuwait are, are f- open to de- dealing with Qatar on most issues, and they could downgrade. Oman as well. Uh, yeah. Sorry? And Oman as well. Uh, yeah. Oman, yeah, I mean, I, I don't see Oman as, as crucial. Uh, I, to me, that as as long as Kuwait and and Jordan remain out of the, you know, remain fairly neutral, uh, Qatar's ability in the in the short and medium run to to wait this out for a little bit, um, you know, is is sort of becomes plausible. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that means that in the long run they can they can be fine. I don't think they can. But um, but that that's it's very interesting. The Jordanian. Role is very, very complex and interesting. That's all I, I wanted to say about it. We'll go to the gentleman here, and I, hopefully we have a mix of people. Uh, I'm William Bree from DynCorp International. It's hard for the U.S. to play an effective role uh, when we don't have agreement uh, between the interagency and the president. Mm-hmm. Have you seen any signs of, uh, of that coming together yet and uh, uh, coming up with a sort of un- a clear and unified policy? So. The folks out uh, on the other side of the Atlantic actually know what our position is. Yeah. Uh, Ellen or Dave would like to uh, address that. Um, well, if you believe that this is essentially, I mean, that our stakes in this are a little bit Paul Mill stakes, mm. and Mattis and Tillerson mm. are considered the grown-ups in the team, and they can work together. I, you know, at that high level of messaging, I think that the situation is is starting to gel in you know what the US position will be. The problem is staffing it further down the chain um, and whether our embassies in the countries affected are able to just you know continue functioning. I mean I do wonder, I, I understand that just yesterday some of the gray areas were clarified that mm. the UAE is still getting gas from Qatar, mm. yes. families of dual nationality will be given exemptions yeah. in terms mm-hmm. of the expulsion. Mm-hmm. So it's it's settling now. There's some practical issues that are not quite as draconian mm-hmm. as they may have seemed mm-hmm. in the early days. Yeah. Um, and I assume that U.S. embassies have been active in trying to keep uh, life as normal as, as possible, mm-hmm. and including maybe defending these kinds of exceptions and yeah. waivers. So, um, you know, I, I guess I don't see a, a catastrophic policy vacuum right now. I, I think that 
there is uh, the beginning of some, some guidance that, you know, we don't want things to get worse. We are going to maintain our relationship with Qatar. We're not participating mm -hmm. in the isolation of Qatar. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the early sketching out of a, of a policy framework, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's remarkable. Yeah. I, think, um, I think the Emirati, Saudi, Egyptian was like shock and awe. And just as mm -hmm. we discovered, if shock and awe doesn't succeed within about three days, then <laughs> what do you do? You know, you become West Clark uh, broadening the, the bombing t database in, in, uh, in Serbia. Um, mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the things that is most remarkable to me about this is, and I spoke with the senior cuttery official last week, they still haven't received a formal list of demands. Mm -hmm. You know, surrender first, and then we'll tell you what we want you to do. Mm -hmm. That, that, that to, to, to me, is, is just... It's just amazing. Now, the second part of your question, I don't know, there are two vital issues in my academic research about which I really don't know a whole lot. The first is Saudi secession, and the second is White House decision making. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and, and people are, um, you know, what I'm hearing is that uh, uh, you have uh, professional staff, albeit undermanned, at the national security agencies, agencies, state and defense, that goes up. You have relatively professional uh, National Security Council, although understaffed as well. But then there's a political layer, the political layer. What I think the incoherence we're seeing, and, and actually, and I should caveat, I was on Al Jazeera on Friday, mm -hmm. and they said, the president is contradicting the Secretary of State. I said, the mm -hmm. president is contradicting the president. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, I, I made this case in print in December where I said, look, the president is a businessman. Mm -hmm. And in business, you dissemble, you threaten, sure. you walk away. In diplomacy, every word you say has meaning. Right. Every potential statement is a statement of policy, as John Kerry found out when he mm -hmm. angrily walked away from the microphone and, and in response to a shouted question saying, yes, we won't attack Syria if they agree to a UN verified mechanism to mm -hmm. remove their weapons as he was walking away. And Sergey Lavrov said, that's the proposal. Let's right. go. We um, accept. Yeah. yeah. So, so um, this president has a business background. And I think mm -hmm. part of what you're seeing is unfamiliarity. Part of what you're seeing is indiscipline. Part of what you're seeing is organizational friction. But uh, my, my colleague quoted Napoleon, let me, um, being an optimist, quote him. Napoleon as well, never attribute to malice that which can adequately yeah. be explained by stupidity. stupidity. Right, right. Um, and inshallah, uh, <laughs> we are dealing with stupidity rather yeah. than malice. Um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me just say, yes, of course, and then I, I have something. Yeah. Uh, well, it was apparent that some in the White House did want to see Qatar sweat this crisis out. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, Tillerson and Matisse, and uh, I, I call them the twin pillars of stability in this administration, uh, the twin pillar policy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well played. So well played. I, <laughs> Game set think, naturally. I think that they know the region very well and be well before joining this administration. And they've been trying to defuse tensions. And they did as much as they can in their own capacity to make sure that, that they're not taking sides in this, in this mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. To me, Tillerson's statement uh, is was very well. It was very measured. Was very intelligent. Was there, but it was it, it. It took sides. Uh, it, it, everyone has to go back to the status quo ante, except Qatar. Qatar must change and change quickly. Except that's, and as well yeah. as easing the blockade as well. So. Uh, oh no, no, but that's going back to the status quo ante. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Like everyone has to go back to to uh, May 25th, except Qatar. Mm -hmm. Qatar must change and change quickly. So that, that's, that's, it's a very, su it's clever, it's subtle, it has all the appearance of being even-handed, but not the substance of being. Sub substantively, it it's take, comes on very firmly on one side. Um, let me just say, it's not so amazing, Dave, uh, that there isn't a list because of three uh, reasons. Number one, well, if you, if, it's only amazing if you assume there was going to be a quick capitulation. And there's no evidence that they assumed that. In fact, to the contrary, I'm pretty sure they didn't assume that. Secondly, you're talking about a, a, a coalition that may not be in complete agreement on what they want internally. You might, get, you might have a Saudi list, an Emirati list, an Egyptian list. Uh, you'd have to reconcile the lists. Thirdly, you've got to have a list that's going to be uh, well received by the United States and others. So there, it's, it's not such a simple matter to put together a list of very, a very specific list of grievances. Uh, so um, I don't find it as amazing as you do. Uh, and I also don't think it's been a big factor uh, that they don't have one. Uh, I don't think it would have made a big difference if they'd had one. Uh, 
you know, from the outset or not. They wouldn't have gotten it yet. And if they produce one today, they won't get it tomorrow. So uh, anyway, um, all the way in the back and then over here. In fact, let's, if we can, let, let's begin with you and then we'll go over there. Uh, <coughs> Ken Meyer-Gord. Thanks, Ken. Does a country of uh, 300,000, which is occupied by foreign troops and is totally dependent on the goodwill of the country from which those troops come, mm. have a foreign policy or does it pretty much do as it's told? Well, and of course, I'm talking about Qatar. Is it occupied? Uh, it's an, uh, technically not, but okay, that's a, that's a good question. Does, does Qatar have an independent foreign policy? Um, I'd say pretty clearly does, and, and that's, the, uh, that's the essence of the dispute. But does anybody want to address? Well, can I address one yeah, part? Yeah, please, of absolutely. You can address the occupation part if you like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, when you walk around Doha, you don't get the same feeling you got in, say, Frankfurt in 1982. <laughs> I mean, you, you will not be, um, the Americans are, in effect, interned. Uh, on that base and to go on and off the base, <laughs> and there are more than one bases, by the way, mm -hmm. but to go on and off LUD, you have to clear cuttery customs. Right. So it's not uh, Mildenhall, England, or Grafenwehr, Germany. Mm. Um, it's more like Iceland, where uh, when we moved in there, we quite purposely decided to uh, confine everybody to the base because otherwise Icelandic culture would cease to mm. exist. So um, I, I think that. It, the Qataris do not view themselves as being occupied, right. but okay. they realize that as long as there's a base there, another country won't come in and, and take right. over. Right. Mm -hmm. so, I think it's so viewed as an insurance policy. Uh, right, so that means that, that uh, well, I mean, it does give the United States tremendous leverage over Qatar, right? At the same time, Qatar has a lot of leverage over the United States. So you've got yeah. this interesting kind of situation where the, in spite of the extreme power <laughs> asymmetry, because they have specific, you know, uh, asks of the other mm -hmm. and requirements, they both have leverage, oddly, right. over each other, right? Would you, would you yeah. like to? Uh, well, please? I also think their spectacular wealth is a source of national power. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. And this is an independent country that has used its resources to promote a brand. I'd go way outside just the bilateral U.S. Qatar relationship mm -hmm. and talk about Qatar rather brilliantly building a global brand. Right. Um, it has soft power. It convenes, you know, global uh, conferences in sports and culture or whatever, and it can influence the votes of other countries at the UN. Yep. And it also takes Sporting pride yeah. in uh, staking out a political space that is a little different than the more conservative monarchies. Mm -hmm. um, I recall a visit by Qatar's foreign minister a few years ago where, you know, they made the connection that they're slightly, they're more whatever you call it, open view towards uh, the Muslim brothers, they aligned that with American values of pluralism um, and freedom of expression. And you can be very okay. cynical and, and say, you know, you know, that doesn't make sense. And, but they, ha they have found ways to yeah. promote uh, a, a kind of maverick persona um, yeah. that makes them a little different than their neighbors. And, you know, again, with the, the wealth they enjoy, they, that is an attribute of national power, even if their security is very much linked to the security provider that they've, uh, they've made a contract with. Yeah. They're, they're not less conservative uh, than their neighbors internally. Uh, well, they're Wahhabis at home. Right. right. Yes. So what yeah. they are is willing to support groups both on the far right and the far left that are anti-status quo in the region. In mm -hmm. other words, Muslim Brothers and left-wing Arab nationalists and promote that which annoys these status quo oriented neighbors and that's I think a, a more accurate way of putting yeah. it. But, uh, uh, but it is interesting on soft power because the, the day this all broke, I mean the late May, uh, CNN called me up and I was talking to them and they were sort of telling me, but isn't this Bambi versus Godzilla? I mean, look <laughs> at how much bigger Saudi Arabia and the UAE are, et cetera. I said, well, at a certain register, yes, until you go to the register of media and soft power, in which case, again, it is Bambi versus Godzilla, but Bambi has become Godzilla. Mm -hmm. And, you know, certainly I, I did this, the Saudis and the Emiratis don't have anything in terms of media and soft political uh, punch in the Arab world that it really compares with uh, Qatar's arsenal, so it depends, you know, how you look at it, and they're not to be underestimated, as you say. It's a it's a source of tremendous leverage, and it it cuts against the idea that this is a either a an occupied country without its own policies. Truly, this is not the American approach, right? The the stuff that is on promoted by Qatar's media empire is not 
Washington's policies by any means. And secondly, it's not to the liking uh, of its neighbors at all. Uh, as, and it, if there's a single factor that's most responsible, it's probably that uh, with the lady back there. Hi, my name is Mara Mordecai. I'm a Can you stand up, please? Sorry. Thank you. Um, my name is Mara Mordecai. I'm a policy intern at the Project on Middle East Democracy. Um, Thanks. I have a question about the role of Turkey, specifically what its motivations and interests are in sort of aligning itself Excellent with Qatar. Mm -hmm. um, I can, I can uh, answer that. I think, I think uh, the Turkish president uh, was in a situation where he wanted to balance between uh, not sacrificing his relation and uh, economic relations with Saudi Arabia, uh, but at the same time, he did not want to abandon the Qataris who supported him uh, over the past years. Mm -hmm. So I think they basically, what they did, they accelerated the deployment of troops in a separate agreement that was passed uh, past week. Um, and uh, actually, the first Turkish troops, I think, arrived in Qatar uh, a mm -hmm. couple of days ago. Um, first and I new ones. Yeah. Uh, new ones, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think basically what happened is that he wanted to give the Qataris a chip to bargain, perhaps with Saudi Arabia and UAE, and perhaps even here in, in, in the US. Um, and I think what's really concerning is that why the Qataris, even though that's a sovereign decision, of course, uh, is why the Qataris felt compelled that they needed this move uh, to to be in a better bargaining position. And I think uh, that that's that's a question that should be answered by you know the the National Security Council here in the U.S. And I think that's the importance of not taking sides in in such disputes. Mm. Anybody else want to take a shot at that? Well, just, let me just say, I don't really know what the Turks are doing in Qatar. Mm. Um, but normally when you have one of these things to show international military force, you say, what capabilities should you send? And usually my response is, well, a color guard, maybe a band, mm. you know, since the purpose is to just mm. show the military is engaged. But that being said, at a tactical level, there is no shortage of, um, of uh, need for training, education, uh, in the Qatari armed forces, and mm -hmm. just as you have Pakistani armed forces in Saudi Arabia, um, uh, you know, it, it's not hard to envision a useful purpose for these forces, but I don't mm. know what they're doing. Uh, there's a, a bunch of, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say there's a bunch of conve conventional wisdom holds that there are three obvious uh, camps or blocks yeah. in the contemporary Middle East, which, which, which is being reflected here. The first being, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, uh, and Jordan, more or less. Uh, that's you know heavily represented on one side. Bahrain also, obviously. Uh, and second group being uh, Qatar, Turkey, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas. Is right. another group that's al also represented in this. And finally, the group that's sitting outside, as uh, Ali said, you know, the not interfering when other people are making their mistakes for you. Uh, Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, uh, et cetera, and you know, the Iraqi militias, et cetera, and Houthis. Uh, if, if that model is right, then uh, this is all, th 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 well, let's put it this way, this a crisis and uh, the reaction of the different parties would seem to validate some aspects of that model, at least at first glance, let's put it that way. Um, next yeah. question, please, uh, got you back there. Lady right here. Uh, two, you and then you, yes? Um, hi, I'm Katrina Salome. I'm a research fellow at Georgetown University. My question is, all this talk in Washington about the Gulf crisis, what is the blind spot that no one sees? The, the what? The blind spot? The blind spot ah, that no you. one sees. What's the blind spot? If I knew what it was, it wouldn't it would be, be blind. blind. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I can foresee all kinds of unforeseen developments. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, don't know. I think, um, climate change, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> today, today it's 119 degrees in Tucson. Right. And uh, the Gulf, there was a study a, a while ago that said temperatures in the Gulf are going to go to 126. Saudi Arabia more than consumes its domestic uh, uh, gas production and air conditioning and then has to burn off some oil as well. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I would say climate change, you know, given, given and, and subsidiary concern to that is salination of the Gulf. Everybody knows the water comes from desalinization, but they forget that the discharge from that, which is hypersalinated, gets yeah. discharged into mm -hmm. the Gulf. So how's that for a blind spot that you didn't expect at this forum? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think the, the, the blind spot and the thing that, we're, that we should be focusing on is that the lack of U.S. leadership in the region. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's very important. And I can't say enough to emphasize emphasize this. I think the um, U.S. Uh, I mean, Trump administration, the uh, or the White House should depend more and more on the on the State Departments and the Defense Department, the bureaucracies that knows and have archives of the whole policies that went through the whole uh, Middle East. And I think that's very important that's moving on. Yeah. Mm. I, I'd say this. I think one thing that's not necessarily a blind spot, but that is being under um, under analyzed, is the the likely two two tracks that uh, this this looks like it'll go on for a while, right? So the, the, in other words, we appear to have reached uh, a stalemate and an impasse that is, where uh, I, I've argued and I continue to argue both escalation and quick resolution are unlikely. So we do, it looks like we're in this for a while. Now, two, two effects will, uh, are likely or can be seen. One is that as this drags on, uh, American frustration and impatience uh, with the impact of this on uh, the, the, the ability of the United States to function, the corrosion of its alliance, its, uh, the, the interference with American military plans, and just this whole desire for unity uh, which is now being sort of rendered, um, you know, greatly undermined, let's put it that way, um, you know, would grow. And so the, the willingness to do what I've just, I think, demonstrated, even Tillerson has done, which is side firmly with one side, not on the other, especially when you think in terms of who, who gets to go back to the status quo ante and who actually has to change, uh, you know, their prior policies, uh, can really be undermined by that. And the idea of just get, of resolving this crisis and get back, get, you know, just get it done with would grow in the United States. On the other hand, Qatar's discomfiture will grow over time. The threat to its own, it's been able to find ways of getting around the immediate problems of food and uh, rerouting its airplanes and things like that. But if this dragged on for, let's say, half a year, a year, I mean, uh, uh, Dr. Gargash, the Minister of State yeah. in, in uh, the UAE, has talked about this going on for years. Well, Qatar wants to host the World Cup. It has lots of ambitions that can't really be realized uh, under this kind of isolation. And as it goes on, the pressure, I think, both on the United States because of uh, the erosion of its interests that I'm talking about, and on the Qataris, uh, because of the long-term problems that it will pose, which are very different than the immediate, how do we get fill our supermarkets, where do our airplanes fly? Those are immediate problems that are resolvable. There are longer-term problems that kick in. And there, I think, you can see the trajectories, and they push in uh, opposite directions. One pushes in the United States, pushing the other states to kind of accept a very minimal gestures from Qatar or something like that and get it done quickly. The other pushes the Qataris to capitulate maybe more than they feel right now that they're willing to do. Madam. Um, so Can you get a microphone, please? Oh. I, I and please, I don't, yeah, but we need the microphone. Need yes, because we're filming and streaming this. Oh. So consider the audience. And please identify yourself. Yes, Susan Ziadi. <laughs> I'm the former U.S. Ambassador to Qatar. Uh, one thing that I would like to raise when the question came about the blind spot, and nobody has talked about that, and that's the people. We've talked about the people in Qatar and, and how much we wonder how much the traffic will bear. I would argue it will, it will bear a lot. Mm -hmm. these, these are pretty stubborn folks, which yep. is sort of one of their sterling qualities, I think. But I think you need to look at the issue of what's your real center of gravity? How far can Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain mm -hmm. go in terms of where the people are affected or where, what the people think uh, in their countries. You mean domestic public opinion? Domestic Sorry. public opinion. It may not be for love of the Qataris, but mm -hmm. there is a common bond among GCC families. Mm -hmm. There are tremendous uh, mm -hmm. uh, intermarriages, trade ties, people who own properties between the different countries. Um, you see a lot, a lot of connections where mm -hmm. I think uh, people will not be so happy. I might also add that if you look at the Arabic uh, Twitter feeds coming mm -hmm. out of a place like Saudi Arabia, there's a lot of support for something called Hamas out of there, yeah. uh, which is at variance uh, mm -hmm. with what the country's official policy is. Right. I mean, rightly or wrongly, I, I'm not taking a position. Well, I'm sure. merely saying that these countries will oh, also have to be thinking about their domestic situation, 
how much it's affecting their people, where mm -hmm. they have uh, uh, interests, and how the people react to what their governments are doing on right. this level. So uh, and, for me, uh, the blind spot yeah, could be the people. Good. Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's a great comment, and also yeah. just just to amplify your point, that's where Qatar's impressive and ample uh, uh, public uh, relations and, and uh, media power, soft power, becomes very helpful to them. I mean, they in the battle for public opinion throughout the Arab world, they have a vast competitive advantage over the other side. So that yeah, in addition, sure. so what about domestic public opinion? So. so um, I mean, in terms of Qatar, internally, their domestic public opinion, in 2000, maybe 14, I was talking with friends who met with a lot of Qataris there, and they said a lot of the Qataris were not in favor of their Qatar's foreign policy back then because they felt they were being kind of isolated. But I think after what happened, this crisis, hmm. based you know on what yeah. you see in social media and, uh, and, and, and interviews with a lot of people, you see some sort of national unity yeah. today in yes. Qatar. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of separating you know, families from different DC countries, um, uh, I have a Saudi and a Qatari couple who are actually were engaged during the, the crisis, and, and they actually were going to get married uh, just a couple of days after the crisis. So now they came to Kuwait. Hmm. To, to get married, and yeah. we're more than happy to host the lovebirds. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's what Kuwait is good at, right? <laughs> yeah, um, Kuwait, Kuwait is and, for lovers. And right. and <laughs> new new slogan. Right. <laughs> and and original basically, to you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in the GCC, right? Yeah. Um, and and uh, and I think, uh, as you said, uh, no matter what the dispute is, by uh, and the GCC will went through the hardest challenge, and it was the uh, invasion in 1990 of Kuwait, and all of them stood together. Today we face, we face the hardest challenge from a different type of form, from internal disputes. Mm -hmm. This, we will, this is, this, this crisis is a diversion from the efforts that we should, should be concentrated somewhere else, and the people of the Gulf should not be impacted. And uh, I think it's a very good thing that the so, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, as well as Bahrain, they provided uh, a, a cell phone or phone number to deal with these humanitarian cases. But I think more concentrated effort should isolate the people and their interests and their hearts, minds, and mm. souls from what's happening uh, in the Gulf. And I, uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, by the way, you can see that, that uh, the uh, countries confronting Qatar uh, are getting uh, very uncomfortable with the food and medicine and family reunification things. And um, they're move, moving away from it, uh, reassuring everyone they're going to find a solution for it, uh, especially, I don't know, uh, food, but medicine and family reunification, I, I think uh, uh, that's not going to be part of the long-term uh, approach because uh, uh, it's just not politically helpful. I mean, I think that that's been understood, that this, there needs to be some adjustment on that. Uh, I think that's, that's mm -hmm. kind of obvious. Um, so we'll just just a quick uh, yeah. two figure. Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember that in the past three decades of sanctions against yeah. Iran, food and medicine Never have always used, yeah. been exempt. Right. Yeah. No. It's it's mm -hmm. normal to exempt those things, and in uh, you know and if, you know the the initial mm -hmm. thought was well this is not a siege. I mean no one's right. saying you can't. It, but but practically speaking, it it uh, looks really uh, bad, and I I think it's going to be rethought on that. But I think it already is being rethought on that basis. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, a bunch of questions. Let's take let's take three or four in a row as we go towards wrapping up. So we've got the two. Uh, how many back there? One, two, three, and then that will be. And we'll take them all, and then and we'll yeah, and that'll be the end of it. So you, and then the gentleman, and then the lady here, and that's it. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, um, Elise Goss Alexander. I'm with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Yeah. Um, I know that. In the past, Qatar has made a name for itself as a mediator who will talk with anyone. And we've seen reports over the past week that Qatari um, presence has been withdrawn from certain areas in East Africa, I yeah. think Eritrea mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and Djibouti. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the ways that this crisis might impact those mediation efforts in different um, areas around the world. Thank you. Good. Okay. And then we'll the gentleman here and then the lady there. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dan Lieberman, I have never been an ambassador at the Qatar. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but, uh, You're welcome. In line with the, the friction between uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, the enemy of my enemy is also my friend. It seems that uh, Saudi Arabia is trying to uh, 
make some rapprochement with Israel. Uh, there's been talk about that. That doesn't mm -hmm. seem possible, but that's been making headlines. I wonder if you had any opinion on that. Okay, good. And then we have the lady here, and then we'll look at all these questions, and then we'll wrap up. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth Cruz. I'm a clerk at BGR Group, and I just wanted to okay. ask about the role and motives of Russia in the region. Good. I know Secretary Mattis said that they just want to interrupt the international order, but I was wondering if they had any more specific concerns. Mm -hmm. Okay, we've got three questions. Uh, Qatar's role as mediator, uh, the uh, Gulf relationship with Israel, especially the Saudi relationship with Israel, and the Russian role uh, in all of this. Uh, let me say, uh, anyone want to tackle any or all of those? Uh, feel free. I'm going to do the third one. Please, the Russian role. Dan. Um, yeah, uh, so let me talk first about uh, Russia and weapons sales uh, in general. Um, and people don't understand this, and I've said this in public for years. There's this common narrative. It, it really shows how, how uh, deeply ingrained Marxian thought is in, hmm. in academia. Um, and I don't mean that in a dismissive way. You know, I'm a graduate of the University of London. That's where Marx is buried. Hmm. Um, but uh, uh, people assume, reporters say, oh, the United States pushing weapons, selling weapons. The way that uh, in the bureaucracy, the, the way the dynamic works in the GCC particularly, these countries ask for more than we're willing to sell them. Um, believe it or not, the big issue is releasability. Uh, if you ask Yusuf El Oteba, he will tell you, we want to buy the Joint Strike Fighter and you won't release it mm -hmm. to us. I can guarantee it. And usually when there's a Russian sales announced, it's there not so much because they want to have Russian equipment because they know what it is. Mm -hmm. they, they want to force us to release right. more capabilities. Right. And when they do buy stuff, um, I believe there was a Saudi buy for Lebanon, for Lebanon. They buy it and give it to somebody else. Yeah. So they buy it, give it to Egypt, buy it, give it to Lebanon, because they don't want to basically mess up their own armed forces. The exception to that is Kuwait, which quite unabashedly says, look, we have to have everybody in the Security Council happy with us, so we're going to do this. The second thing is the Russian intervention um, in Syria, I have argued, is uh, basically a feint. It was designed to be a... Um, bargaining chip to come to a grand bargain over Ukraine, right? mm. English for Ukraine, mm. but they were pushing on an open door yeah. met with such great success. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russians have lost fewer than 50 people right. in Syria. Their investment is minimal. They could leave within two weeks. Mm -hmm. And they would if we would, for example, recognize their sovereignty over the Donbass and lift mm -hmm. uh, in, in exchange for that. So I think um, it's possible. I think generally conventional strategic analysts make too much of the Russian presence in the Middle East. Yeah. Uh, I just don't think they have that span, yeah. and I don't think that the client base is there for them on the western side of the Gulf. I completely agree with that. Maybe I can chip in on the second question Please. on, on Saudi-Israel uh, relations. Mm. You know, I think, I think Saudi Arabia, uh, with the King Abdullah Initiative, uh, the peace process, uh, that's been endorsed by all the Arab countries as well as uh, Iran, I believe, um, uh, basically, it was a roadmap into reaching uh, a permanent solution with Israel in the region. Mm. And I think all countries in the region would like to see this uh, uh, conflict uh, come to an end. But I think uh, moving forward, however, I, th I find it very difficult for Saudi Arabia to make public moves in terms of opening relations with Israel unless they are very concrete and affirmative and bold uh, moves made by Israelis in terms of uh, moving forward in the peace uh, process. Otherwise, I find the chances to be very dim. Mm. I've written a lot about this, so you can look up my articles if you're interested. Uh, easy to find on the, the Atlantic and foreign policy and things, places like that. Uh, in addition, I just want to say one uh, thing before we have sort of go to some final thoughts. Uh, on this subject, I don't have anything to say about Qatar as a mediator, but on this issue, what's really fascinating about how Gulf relations with Israel have played into this crisis, and it, it has been a factor, is that uh, the, if you accept the notion that the, the remarks attributed to Sheikh Tamim were a hack and were cooked up by somebody else, then uh, the notion of uh, cooperation, Qatari cooperation with Israel, 
uh, was part of the set of charges in, in implanted there. Uh, not a major one, but it was almost almost also like uh, inbuilt with Hamas and Hezbollah because the idea was sort of like, and Qatar has very good relations with Hamas and Hezbollah and very good relations with Israel, uh, all of which is sort of more or less true and depending on what you mean by very good. Uh, but uh, it, it sort of points out that the uh, interesting dichotomy uh, which is characteristic of a lot of Qatar's sort of, um, policies would to, to be on the one hand this and on the other hand that. And uh, uh, that's true even if the remarks were completely uh, fictitious. On the other hand, um, the uh, Israel card or the uh, even in a way the pro-Israel card, the, the Jewish American pro-Israel card, was uh, not only uh, a part of what looks to be a Qatari counterattack, especially against the UAE, it was the essence of it. Uh, and I mean here the emails that were released that are not dis the authenticity which is not disputed, uh, where it centers on the notion, and especially as that got inflected through media, both American and, and uh, pro Qatari Arab media, uh, as being essentially a set of accusations that boil down to. Uh, yes, but you guys cooperate with the Israelis and you guys cooperate with pro-Israel groups in the United States and uh, sort of exhibit A in a counterattack. What that means is that th these are uh, societies where, uh, where all three of these countries, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Qatar, have all gone quite far compared to where they used to be in dealing with the Israelis, uh, either on the margins or under the table. Uh, the Qataris is not least of the three. Uh, yet, uh, at a public register, it becomes uh, uh, actually not only something you, you want to be very careful about uh, politically for the reasons that Hamad was uh, talking about and that I've gone into more detail about before, but also a stick that you can use to beat each other with if you need to. Mm -hmm. And what that goes to is how complicated this is going to be for these countries in Israel if they want to move forward, absent the kind of political developments and political process that Hamad was talking about between Israel and the Palestinians. In other words, this has been a very good example for anyone who's interested in the outside-in thing working about how difficult it's going to be and how much heavy lifting will have to be done, uh, not only between Israel and the Gulf states, but also between Israel and the Palestinians to make this happen. Uh, so having said, does anybody want to talk about Qatar as a mediator? Uh, yes, go right ahead. Please. I can only speculate, but um, yeah, it's possible that the government called back people hmm. serving in diplomatic roles as they sort of um, convene, you know, what is our message, how are we going to handle this, um, or, and possibly for the safety of their personnel. Uh, but I would argue that they should be as active as they can be on diplomatic endeavors that are outside of their immediate region as a way of, you know, consolidating their, who are their friends and who would uh, speak for them in international fora. So I, I'm speculating that maybe this is just a temporary callback until things uh, clarify a bit. Um, sounds but, right. Yeah. No, that sounds right. I, yeah. I think that sounds right. Um, let me, let me um, ask, we're going to wrap up in yeah. a second, but let me ask uh, all of our panelists, uh, and we can go down the line beginning with Ali. Uh, and Dave, then Hamad, and then Ellen, uh, for some final thoughts. And particularly if you can uh, talk about what do you think we ought to expect uh, from the parties, and in Ali's case from Iran, and Hamad's case from uh, Kuwait, as well as other Gulf states, uh, and uh, all of you can talk about the American role. Where do we see this going? Where do you see this going? Uh, and what do you uh, expect? And if you like, what would you want to see? Uh, in a, just take a couple of minutes uh, in uh, in the coming uh, few weeks and months. I'll begin with Ali and come down the line towards me. Well, on the Iranian side, I think as as long as the situation more or, more or less remains the same, the Iranians are probably going to adopt a similar strategy to what they have at the moment. Mm. The one thing that could change this is any kind of clash, uh, direct or indirect, uh, you know, planned or inadvertent between Iran and the U.S. somewhere in one of these flashpoints that mm. the two countries. Do you, uh, you mean a military clash yeah, or a diplomatic? Okay, military, military clash yeah. okay. uh, somewhere either in the Strait of Hormuz or now in eastern Syria, mm -hmm. around Al Tan, or in Iraq, or in Yemen, mm -hmm. any kind of clash that would uh, you know, result in escalation, serious escalation of tensions between Iran and the US, 
could have ripple effects about how Iran deals with uh, some of the regional uh, issues mm -hmm. that it hasn't uh, interfered in too much, including this crisis, but also uh, you know eastern province of Saudi Arabia or even uh, Bahrain. So it would, would throw all kinds of things into play that haven't been in play, right? Um, that makes sense. Dave? Um, well, I think that uh, if this problem isn't solved by Eid, it's going to go on for at least a few months, mm -hmm. if not longer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, the question as to whether or not the United States gave a green light to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, this is, this is going to be like the April Glaspie Saddam yeah. Hussein conversation will be debated for years. Uh, but I can tell involved, you yeah. that if they did see a green light, the signal was malfunctioning. Right. The bureaucracy is, uh, does not want this to go on. This dispute harms American national security interests. Mm -hmm. It is not in our interest for this dispute to go on. Right. We are focused on the Middle East, but we have to understand that in terms of how the broader U.S. government views this, this is a border dispute between Paraguay and Bolivia, but with higher stakes. It needs to be resolved quickly. And if um, either side thinks the United States is going to decisively engage on its side against the other, they are mistaken. Um, the bureaucracy is going to say, look, get this done so we can focus on what's mm -hmm. important. Right. And uh, inshallah, that'll happen by Eid. Well, that, thank you. That's what I was saying. Inshallah, Dave. <laughs> that, was, um, that was super you know, helpful. A, qu a quote by Winston Churchill comes to my mind. He said that the U.S. will always make the right decision <laughs> after they exhaust every other option. Yeah. <laughs> so the, right. path, the path forward, I think, should be very clear. The U.S. should take a leadership, ro uh, a leadership role in the region and be a force of stability. Um, it should not take sides, and I think they should push for solving this crisis within the GCC. Mm. And whenever and if possible, and uh, they can join as a guarantor of the implementation process review committee later on, perhaps even other allies in the region that should be. I think what's happening right now, and un unintendedly perhaps, is a diversion from what the focus should be on, um, ISIS is on the defeat right now in Iraq. 96% of Mosul is liberated. Mm -hmm. uh, in Syria, they are uh, on the defensive, and I think their last stand right now in Deir Zod, that's very good. Uh, I think what will happen in the region is, is uh, the future of Iraq, uh, the stability of the future of Iraq and, and Syria, and these are the files I think that should be tackled hand on uh, swiftly and quickly to make sure the region is stable back again and on its feet. And thank you. Excellent. And Ellen, the last word is yours. And, uh, 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 well, I think that um, the Qataris will have to find some concessions to make, mm -hmm. of whether they are deeply significant concessions or whether they are somewhat symbolic. Um, but I think the burden is on them to relieve the pressure a little bit. But I think there's a bigger issue for the United States and for other uh, external partners of the GCC, and that is the survival of the GCC. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, there has been a diversity of views on Iran within the GCC. There's been a diversity of views on how far and how fast to integrate economically, et cetera. So I think we have to um, sort of pull back a little bit on any expectations. Look, the Saudis were the ones who were pushing for political union right. and for further uh, economic integration measures. But I don't think that um, we sh I think that we have an out that we outsiders have an interest in not allowing this crisis to um, unravel the, the, the GCC. Not that the GCC was a completely powerful and effective organization, but it was minimally useful and was a basis on which one could expand uh, cooperation that's badly needed in the region. Mm -hmm. Great. On, on that excellent note, I think we'll say thank you very much uh, to everybody. Join us again next time. And join me in thanking our panelists.